Well, hello. Hello, the Rainer. Um, so we are here June 7th, 2014, at the GSU Women and Gender Archives. And we're going to talk to you about your life and how the things that happen in your life fit into the archives here. Uh, so now I usually I call you Peachy, which is really your last name, not your first name. Questo è un nome italiano. No, oh, yeah. So maybe we'll start with like your family, your blood family, you know, where you were born, and then tell me a little biography about you. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to do this. I think now as I get older and I see my life, <laughs> the rest of my life in the distance, it's kind of nice to reflect and get all this organized. And I will say that in this preparation, I've, uh, I've been living and working in Atlanta for the past 40 years. And when I came up with that number, I was a little, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, 40 years. And um, for 38 of those years, I've shared a home life and a home with another woman and a combined total of about 14 rescued kitty cat companions. I was born in Buffalo, New York, yay, which is a city known all over the world for freezing cold blizzards and spicy chicken wings. <laughs> I was also raised in Buffalo, New York with a mother and a father and three brothers before parental discretion was advised. And because I was the only daughter, the only girl, the oldest granddaughter, I suppose there was a time in my life early on that I was content to be made of sugar and spice and everything nice until faced with child chubbiness and issues with my weight as a very early preteen. I I had recalled one incident with our pediatrician when I was 11 or 12, and he said, Franny, for a girl of your weight, you should be 27 feet tall. <laughs> According to well, anyway, I was also brought up Catholic and Italian, actually Sicilian, which is even more Italian. And I will say that this combination of Catholic and Sicilian as a dominating influence early on really did make my younger years very simple ones. Everything was either forbidden or compulsory. And I must say that I, I can't tell you how many teenage years I spent looking for loopholes in the Ten Commandments. Couldn't find them. I was a little wild. I remember when I was 14 years old, and this is something I've said in the past, I asked my mother what an orgasm was, and she said, don't ask me, ask your father. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> well, the very next year I decided to enter the convent at 15. I sent away for the brochure, filled out the application, toured the nunnery, and my mother was thrilled. My father said, no 15-year-old only daughter of mine is going to become a nun. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. <laughs> right after high school, I enrolled in college for the first time. I went to the University of Buffalo, and I was there during the Vietnam War, the Kenton Jackson State shootings the Wounded Knee Uprisings, the Attica Prison Riots, <laughs> and the second wave of the women's movement. Yay! A few little things. Yeah, a few little And actually, back then, University of Buffalo, or UB, was a very activist university. We uh, were referred to as the Berkeley of the East. And as a result of that activism, there were a couple of months where they deployed the National Guard to our campus, about 200 of them, and it really wasn't a situation where you see now where they're just kind of hanging out in groups. This was a clear deployment. They were in formation, on high alert, and sometimes with their rifles pointed towards our student bodies. 
Well, fortunately, it was very scary. I mean, it was a, not a very uh, good environment that was conducive to learning unless you looked out the window. And as our political science professor said, we're just going to close the books, look out the window. All you need to know is what's happening right outside there. Well, fortunately for me, also on the campus at that time was the newly founded Buffalo Women's Studies College. And at the time, the Buffalo Women's Studies College was one of only two women's studies programs in the country. Ah, yeah. The other and the first was and still is at San Diego State University. And I even remember the very first women's studies course I took. It was called WSC 213 Women in Contemporary Society. <laughs> Changed my and I will never forget the very first time I walked through the doors of the Women's Studies College and I looked around. I knew right then and there that I had found my people. Yeah. I mean, the mother and ship. <laughs> that place was crawling with dykes. I mean, young and old and tall and short and thin and round and I, 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 I. <laughs> I was so excited, I was so turned on, that I volunteered for everything. I joined the budget committee, the curriculum committee, the financial aid committee, the governance committee, <laughs> the hedonist caucus. I even staffed the place four days a week plus going to school. And after, oh, I would say three months, of just three months of walking through the doors of the Buffalo Women's Studies College, this 19-year-old Sicilian Catholic only daughter was given a set of keys to the front door. I had my own set of keys to the Buffalo Women's Studies College. Right. Um, I'm gonna take a sip. This is okay the way we're doing this? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good, because I have a couple, I have another yeah, story. Yeah. I can remember a time at the Women's Studies College, it was a Saturday and I think we were we were going to do a marathon day of events. We were started off in the morning with a governance meeting. In the afternoon, we had a women concerned for the political direction of the college meeting, followed by a potluck dinner. After that, we had a coffee house. After the coffee house, we had a meeting of the Hedonist Caucus. <laughs> and I, I probably got home at, oh, Three or four o'clock in the morning, still living with my parents and my brothers, and I had accidentally left the agenda for the governance meeting on the front seat of the family car. So wait, and there's more. So what the number one agenda item for that particular governance meeting just happened to be how to deal with lesbianism in the Women's Studies College. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> and you know, I'm sure you remember, but way back then in the 70s, how to deal with lesbians in the women's movement was, you know, a uh -huh. frequent discussion, a hot topic, some would say a red herring, <laughs> if you want to put it in fish terms. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, at 7 o'clock in the morning, my father comes busting through my bedroom, waving this agenda over his head, and he says, Franny, does this mean that my 19-year-old Sicilian Catholic only daughter is a buck? <laughs> and I said, Pop, What's a buck? And he said, why, it's a woman who loves other women, who lives with other women, and who has sex with other women. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> buck. <laughs> well, shortly, that, that kind of scared me. I kind of got a take on where they might be in this situation with what I was potentially becoming. And so uh, shortly after that incident, I left my parents' home and the state, and I moved south. Oh. And I tell you this because I, I really, I think I left Buffalo for two really main reasons. One was fear, 
that my family would uncover my homosexuality. And the second reason was the Southern women. <laughs> I mean, oh my honey, please. It's all I needed. And, and I must say, and I'll just add this, ever since that move, I have tried just about everything that life has to offer except for heterosexuality and uh, folk dancing. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I left Buffalo, 1974, moved to Atlanta, debust. The moment I debust, I immediately joined Alpha, <laughs> the Atlanta Lesbian Feminist Alliance. Now you knew about Alpha before you yes. got there? Okay. Martha Smith said, you got to come down here. We got an organization. I think you might need it. <laughs> and I said, I'm there, got on the bus. And, um, and actually, as you know, but I'll say this, Alpha was probably the only lesbian feminist organization in the country. Um, she existed for 22 years, 1972 to 1994. I got there right at the beginning, probably 1974. And uh, again, Alpha, joining Alpha changed my life once again. Uh, I mean, Alpha was a wonderful organization. Alpha was a, a political place, a social place, an educational place, um, a safe place. It was basically a place where a bunch of dykes could get together and try to come up with some lesbian feminist theories to go along with our lesbian feminist practice. <laughs> and, um, in, and as I was reflecting and preparing for this interview, I remembered that in 1980, I had uh, just successfully sued my employer for sexual discrim sex discrimination and uh, say a little more about that the details um, about that I can't about? really say too many details because oh, okay. part of the settlement but, oh, I see. Okay. but it was a pretty big corporation it was sex discrimination failure to promote mm -hmm. and I wanted I had Margie Pitts Haynes who was a famous Atlanta women's lawyer here um, back then she was on the case and we won we settled and the money a, a good portion of the money that I won in the settlement I donated to Alpha and Alpha turned around and used that to fund the Antioch interns and also oh, well, they I didn't remember about where the money came from to do the Antioch interns that was oh, me nice. and and that was something that really you know, I it replenished itself too because the actual money was not only used to fund the interns, it also gave me a job because part of the settlement was, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with this company. Mm -hmm. um, so I needed work. They hired me as the alpha administrator, and I think it was a couple of years because I had at least two interns, Chris and Ruth. Okay. And part of the responsibility of that role was to fundraise outreach and to re resupply the fund. So it was very successful. I loved it. I was so happy. And I forgot about that. So anyway, I was yeah. the alpha yeah. coordinator Great. for about a year. Yeah. Um, I also joined the Alpha Omegas, and this is definitely going to require a sip of water. <laughs> and as you know... The Alpha Omegas were the first, very first, and only out of the closet lesbian feminist softball team to play in the city of Atlanta League. Uh, the first. Well, not team, only the first, yes. The first, yes. Yeah, yeah, we were, well, at the time, we were the first. At the time, yes. And the only. We were definitely the only. Oh, at the time. You're right. That, yeah. that year. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And I think later. So you joined right away. It was 74 when we first got us. Actually, league, so you. That's another thing Martha Smith said, and by the way, we got a softball team <laughs> that we're trying to get together. Um, and I think, I remember the first year, we all of the, almost all the women on the team were lesbians, except for two, who were, we thought, using their rookie season to make the decision, <laughs> to make the choice, to make the choice, to make the decision. And also, the Atlanta uh, Alpha Omegas, were a non, uh, in the spirit 
of lesbian feminism were a non-competitive softball team. And what that meant was that if you came to the practices, you played in the games, regardless of skill level, regardless of experience, right. regardless of athletic ability, <laughs> regardless of whether it was a close game in the bottom <laughs> of the late innings with a runner in scoring position and one out, <laughs> regardless of that situation, we were a non-competitive softball team. And we did have fun. I mean, again, Alpha Omegas changed my life. Right. It was a, a way for us to come together as a team. We had such fun as, you know, I, I look at that time as women kind of experimenting a lot with open relationships, different relationships. We've been siloed for many years, we really didn't even know each other existed, and now we're in an environment where we're coming together in a relatively traditional teamwork framework, but as I mentioned, we decided to be not cutthroat, competitive, mm -hmm. our goal was not to win, our goal was to showcase some of the lesbian feminist values that we were trying to incorporate into our right. lives and our belief systems. and. I remember, and yes, we did have fun. I remember Amy, our, one of our ace coach, would get us all together for practice and say, okay, everyone assume your favorite positions. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. <laughs> and, um, and one of the things that I do remember is the second year, with this mantra in mind, to assume your favorite positions, have a lot of fun, is um, I think the second year, two of the infielders, the short fielder, and one of the coaches were all having some sort of a romantic relationship with each other. I mean, some of the affairs were overt, some were covert. I could see everything. Me, I was a catcher for a while, so I I could see it all. <laughs> I got a good view of the playing field, mm -hmm. so I could see it all and developing. You more than just the, the, the golf ball inside. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was thinking, you know, this infield is a whole lot more incestuous than those distant, <laughs> unrequited outfielders. But, um, you know, like I said, we were trying new things. We were looking at exploring ways of relating to each other in relationships that were not limited to a partnership. In other words, we, were, some of us were, and this environment was perfect for it, uh, playing around with a little non-monogamy. And I'll never forget, and, and you know, this type of experimenting did lead on to the softball field during the games. One game, Peachtree Hills, 1975. Wow. I was playing shortstop for some reason, because I'm usually your catcher. I was usually mm -hmm. your catcher. Right, right. I'm playing shortstop and I hear the left fielder bickering out there with the short fielder who was now her girlfriend. And I wrote this down because I thought it was a classic quote. She said, I know what I said about non-monogamy, but why go and ruin a perfectly good theory by putting it into practice? <laughs> <laughs> to which she bolts into the field in deep center field and then short fielder girlfriend she's having the fight with drops her mitt and takes off after her and I'm like okay we're in a game here <laughs> this is a softball game no crying in baseball <laughs> and so I th now this could be an exaggeration but it is kind of funny so I remember I was also an assistant coach at the time so I said okay huddle up everybody we we need to talk here. Look, at, we're all lesbians. I was a peacemaker. I was a facilitator at this point. I took off, took off the mitt, became a facilitator, and I said, look, at, huddle up, everyone. We're all lesbians. We're all feminists. We're all part of this social and political alliance, living within this somewhat restricted, male-dominated, patriarchal societal structure. I mean, even our lesbian subculture, in part, is defined by these white, male, heterosexual role models and values, when in fact our, our, the very nature of our deviant lives and lifestyles should lead us to explore, maybe even create some new and different and better ways of interacting lovingly with each other in relationships, which 
put everybody right to sleep. I mean, <laughs> they just, <laughs> they just uh, I don't you know, remember it. Maybe I really did go to sleep too. Right? Yes, you did. <laughs> it was hard to put you to sleep, Maureen. Oh, and it was it was quite an experience. I I must admit it was. We really did a lot of things. We tried a lot of different ways and. So we play the rest of that game, and what happened? Ah, uh, probably oh, we no. did. We called it, but it was it it was quite. We were having growing pains. I mean, mm. we had some ideas in mind of what we wanted to do, how we wanted to. Like I said, think about relationships not limited to a partnership. More, being more inclusive. Um, there were a lot of women out there, very much like me, that had pretty much orphaned as a result of our chosen or given lifestyle that in that type of environment in the 70s, one of the things that you gave up, which at the time was the dominant um, ideology, was your relationship with men, whether it be the financial contribution you would get from a father, mm -hmm. a husband, a boyfriend, a brother, Back then, when, when I chose to leave, I left all of that. Mm -hmm. And the key that all we all were trying to do was build a life outside of that dominant nuclear family. I certainly think that Alpha, as was the Alpha Omegas, and when I get on to Red Dyke Theater, those were vehicles for us to build some sort of non-blood community. Mm -hmm. um, and we took in, you know, people that had were in much more difficult situation than me. I had a good relationship with my family by virtue of the fact that they just, I left. What they didn't see or didn't know about was fine. Italians do that real well. I don't want to know. <laughs> just to make sure you're eating okay, you look where you're going, you wear the miraculous medal, keep it on. I don't want to know. But I wasn't dead to them. Yeah. I was what I like to say is a distant relative <laughs> who was very much engaged. And I think uh, at, at, at the same time with the Alpha Omegas and softball, in tandem with that was Red Dyke Theater. Mm -hmm. And I'll go on to Red Dyke yeah, Theater just a little. Yeah, what that was and how that happened. Or? Well, in 1974, I moved to Atlanta first, but I had a best friend and still do, Mickey Alberts. We lived in Buffalo together, and um, actually, when I had that incident with the buck, with my father, you know, and I knew that I, I ran to Mickey right away, and I said, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And she said, well, did you tell them anything about the agenda item? And I said, well, they saw it. And she said, okay, this is what you do. You tell them that the reason it was on the governance meeting agenda was because they were trying to figure out a way to get the lesbians out of the <laughs> And I said, really? And she said, yeah, you got to do it. I think this is kind of, this requires some strategic lying. Just to, it's an unsafe space right now. So it, it really worked. My parents... We're like, well, we just kind of thought so, that that wasn't really you, and we're like, they knew. I mean, they were like, who's she trying to kid? So Mickey and I were in Buffalo, and at the time, we were part of a theater group called Stars and Dykes Forever. Did not know that. Yes. And it was very much like, it was different than Red Dyke Theater because it was more in a coffee house setting where people did, um, it was mostly lesbians, although there were women who were not lesbians that were part of the group. Uh, it was a lot of poetry, a lot of music, and we did skits, comedic skits. So when Mickey moved to Atlanta six months after I did, we all lived in a collective on Page Avenue called Taffy Towers, getting back to the conversation about, you know, taking in a lot of people. There were probably eight women who were the original Taffy Towers, plus a baby, Booger, I don't remember. Adrian. I have oh, pictures. Oh, Booger. Because oh, Murray lived said. with okay. us. Yeah, and yeah, Murray yeah. had I, just... I didn't hear what you said, of course. Mur Murray, yeah. Murray and Booger and mm -hmm. Jean and uh, CK and Jane Black and Mickey and me and... Oh, I don't know. There, and there were, like I said, sometimes there were squatters that came. Mm -hmm. 
as a place to live for a little while. But the, the core of the collective at Page Avenue, um, you know, you get a bunch of women together, they're living together. When you get out over the incest and all that, <laughs> the next thing you do, you pop a couple of beers and let's have a show. <laughs> so that was before the before you go on to Red Deck Theater, since you said a collective, say a little bit more about what a household like that was and, and why you call it a collective. Well, we all, it was a house, Pam Parker's father owned the house and we rented from him. And uh, we had an upstairs and a downstairs. We figured out early on that all the people's needs for, uh, some people were in relationships, some were not. Um, we had a baby on board that we decided needed to be in the upstairs with Jean, who was, I would say the designated mama ah, of the house okay. we Mickey and I were fine with that even though normally we would have been as the founding mothers of things we would have wanted to use our influence to maybe have that type of mama but I was not interested Mickey wasn't either she was playing the field so we thought maybe we'll turn this over to Jean she's gonna be the house mother the den mother <laughs> And I would say I characterize her in that way because she was trying to make sure we all ate right. Uh, it was the age of vegetarianism and we were coming off of Hostess cupcakes. I mean, we were very, <laughs> uh, and Jean, and we thought that since we had a baby, I think Adrian Booger was, oh, I don't know, six months to a year and Marie was a single mom, that maybe they needed to have the upstairs flat to just kind of separate them a little bit from the insanity that was on the first floor which would be all I'll need to say is that we were young we were experimenting we were having a lot of fun and um, we were a little edgy you know we were uh, at the time and uh, there was and I would say there was a pretty robust women's nightclub scene in Atlanta there was the, Greta, the Garbos, Tower Lounge, um, and there was another, I don't think the sports page existed at that time, but we lived what, in the... you here when there was the, um, I think it was called the Great Tower on Ponce, something tower. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I do remember that. Yeah. Well, in getting back to the collective, we all are, I, I don't think we shared finances. Like we all had our own individual incomes, whatever that might be. But we had uh, a pool of money that we had every week that people put in for rent, for food. Um, and our social life was all around each other. I mean, we, and Martha Smith used to come in here and there and she'd say, I don't know how y'all can do this. Because at one point we were all sleeping with each other. I mean, it was, and again, it was this environment where we were all experimenting. We were very close. We were very open, and we were um, participating in a lot of things collectively outside of the house, Alpha, Softball, and Red Deck Theater, and we were bonded. I mean, and, yeah. and, it, and we had to work through that. And again, this was a totally different environment. Our belief systems were different. We were in each other's face, running through the house naked all the time. What do you think is going to happen? Um, that was a wonderful experience. Again, Page Avenue, Red Dyke Theater, changed my life. It was an opportunity for us to come together, uh, really a variety of different people. We're coming from all different ages, places, with a strong inclination towards creative, giving creative voice mm -hmm. to our experience. Um, certainly something that you would say was undergirded the softball teams and also was a basis of Alpha. But in Red Deck Theater, it was very focused on, okay, we want to say this in this way, we want to address this issue, and we can do it through comedy, through music, through visuals. I remember right before any of our Red Dyke Theater performances, we would go out into the community. The gay pride marches were the best time and take pictures and pictures and pictures of 
lesbians and gay people out there in the world being who we were. Mm -hmm. And as we would take the picture, which of course now, you know, with iPhones and digital pictures, you've got a, everybody's doing it. But back then it was yeah. a 35 millimeter experience. Mm -hmm. And you, when you went up and you took a picture of someone, you said, look it, I just want to let you know, how would you feel about this being part of a Red Deck Theater slideshow? Because we always had a uh, preview of mm -hmm. our shows. We started with a slideshow and it really was a way to bring all of our audience together yeah. to see, there we are. Anyway, so we, um, how did I bring that up? Why did I bring that up? I mean, how, how did, maybe thinking of how you, Red Deck Theater got put together, started, and how you decided what, how, what creative ways you'd be. There, thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, so we were giving now you you and Mickey had some background with a with a theater group like that. Were there other people in the group who also had worked in in theater or other, you know, creative performing kind of thing? Yes, Jean came from what would be a Montessori like traditional theater. Her family was uh, theater based, mm -hmm. so she understood the basics of presentation and performance. Uh, of course, Jane is the funniest person I know, so she's a natural comedian. CK had a lot of experience with audio and visual. She was our technical person. Uh, Deborah Gray was had experience in lighting, so she wanted to get on board. Mary Jane, our lighting technician. Woe Donna, guitar, music. Um, Bonnie was had some. Bonnie was in Red Eye Theater. Oh. She was more, yeah, and she was the subject of the film we did on trial. She, when we got into more serious skits, we did a skit that Winona and Marcelina filmed, and it was called On Trial. And we were pretty experienced. I mean, we had MCC Church to as our main space of mm -hmm. performance, and it was um, that was the one where we brought the motorcycle in. Or yeah. Peach Midler and the yeah, Diecats. Yeah. Like I said, that was in the last. Explain, uh, it, it's not a traditional church. Explain where that was. Uh, MCC was on Virginia Highland Avenue, and I think, what is it now? It's 800 Virginia Highland. Yeah, there's some all kind of businesses over there. Okay. I'm not sure if whether it's still like a theater, um, but it was an old cinema. It was an old movie house right. that had closed. And MC Metropolitan Community Church took it over, and then since Red Dyke Theater, we mainly did benefits. We were not; we were a nonprofit, for benefit only uh, theater group. Mm -hmm. So MCC was the perfect venue, had a an actual stage that was relatively clear of debris, <laughs> and we could, uh, and it had seats and a proscenium stage and an audience, and we just loved it. And it even had a tech booth. Because we had some sophisticated uh, audiovisual uh, content in our shows. We always had music. We always had, well, I'll just double back. Part of the reason uh, when we were in Tacky Towers and when we formed Red Dyke Theater, and as you probably know, there was a, a good um, uh, synergy, what's that word? We coexisted with a lot of the gay men's bars, where the entertainment of the time was disco music and female impersonation mm -hmm. drag queens. Mm -hmm. And we were just loving it. I mean, Sweet Gumhead, we would go all the time, and we became big friends with the drag queens, Lily White, Kitty Litter, mm -hmm. Satan DeVille, Charlie, um, Charlie, I have it written down. I'll have to think about that because she was a, a, a Diamond Lil, Diamond Lil. Who's still, who's still around. Amber Richards. I mean, we became very good friends with uh, the Charlie drag. Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and one of the things that we had, you know, being lesbian feminists, we were in, we were concerned about the way women, the men were representing the women. So we thought, okay, we can do this. So we began parroting, <laughs> as you know, the um, the female impersonation in, in Red Dyke Theater. And actually, I want to make sure I don't miss any of this. Okay. Uh, we were very involved in both gay and lesbian in the women's communities. 
Uh, we patronized both the men's and the women's bards. We developed an appreciation and formed this kinship with the drag queens. Um, and we chose contemporary music to highlight our own characters in our reclaiming of those images. For example, Peach Midler and the Dykettes, mm -hmm. which was a takeoff at the time of a very popular Bette Midler and the Harlots. I mean, she was one, I think, in way back then that really embraced mm -hmm. the gay community, right. Bette Midler. Um, Diana Ross and the Superbs, joined by the Femtations, which <laughs> was a takeoff <laughs> on Diana Ross and the Temptations. Gladys Peach and the Cliffs. Yes, I remember them <laughs> specifically. <laughs> yeah. And these were. This brings up something because our the, uh, 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 our theater our shows were very interactive for the time, and the custom in the gay bars, of course, with the female impersonators, is that if you liked what they were doing, you'd go right up on stage, mm -hmm. you take a dollar, stuff it down their shirts, their blouses, uh, hand them money, hand them notes. I mean, you just for something that was as scripted as lip syncing to recorded music. It was quite a skill to be able to pull that off with pe people are people coming are up. Coming up. Yeah. And our audiences adopted that same mm -hmm. culture as well. And I remember Joe and BC, who were the owners of the Tower Lounge and the Sports Page. I th Joe was crazy about me. She just loved Gladys Peach and the Cliffs. <laughs> and every time we did a show, and we knew we had to have Midnight Train to Georgia in there because Joe's and BC are going to be in the crowd. Joe, over the course of the months before a show, would have a little Seagram 7 velvet bag that she would take her tips and fill it with coins. And I knew that every show that I did, Midnight Train to Georgia, coming up that aisle mm -hmm. was Joe and BC to take that and stuff it down my <laughs> <laughs> Just, just oh, wonderful, right. and you know, and I, you know, I, the, the one I remember, a uh, single person was Murr doing Al Green as Al Queen. Al Queen, <laughs> Murray was the best dancer, and we did want to do some male drag. You know, we just didn't want to be impersonating female impersonators <laughs> doing women. I mean, it was like, okay, where are we now? We're <laughs> we're women. We're lesbians impersonating the female impersonators. And, but actually, we got so good after a while that we weren't, we were really appropriating the gay culture in the nightclubs and the men's bars, but we really had reclaimed mm -hmm. our lip syncing and our performance to a level. I mean, we rehearsed, I mean, I'm telling you, we were. <laughs> and we, and Murray said, you know, we need to do a man. And so she did Al Queen, which was her signature, um, uh, and our representative boy, uh, and the Pussy Sisters mm, take yeah. off on the Pointer Sisters. Pussy <laughs> Sisters, La, Be La Douche, which was our takeoff on La Belle. <laughs> oh, I mean, my God. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, and then we also had, uh, as you remember, we got to a point where a lot of our shows had themes, like Tit Witness News, which was mm, the takeoff mm -hmm. on. A news broadcast and we were very uh, interactive with our audiences not only during the performances but after we would have talkback sessions because we knew we were also kind of edgy we had had a philosophy of reclaiming certain uh, images of women reclaiming certain words mm -hmm. like yeah. pussy dyke and clit and clit yeah. Cunt too, but we really never used cunt, and I, it's as Mickey said, I just don't think we could ever find anything to rhyme it with. <laughs> I said it's probably better. Maybe in football you could have found. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> oh, that's true. We did have football teams. It wasn't as formal cunt as cunt Alpha <laughs> Omegas, but yeah, we did have Sunday footballs at Iverson Park. I forgot that. <laughs> I need to write that. So. At, uh, in our talkback sessions after our performances, you know, we wanted feedback from people and, you know, all those women from the lesbian connection and some more conservative lesbian feminists would use it as an opportunity to critique what we did, which we were embracing that because we were 
instigating a dialogue. That was our goal. And I remember us all lined up on the stage with <laughs> one of the shows was at MCC and Elizabeth brought Charlotte Bunch from Feminist Quarterly. And Furies? Furies? The Furies. Yeah. And she was, she, I remember her in the talk back. She said, I must admit, Elizabeth told me that I was going to be seeing something that was a little unusual, a little edgy, a little fringe, and that uh, I was a little concerned about the idea of people coming up on stage and giving you money and tipping it in your clothes. But I loved it. <laughs> and she was, and the reason I mention this is because Elizabeth told me she was bringing Charlotte Bunch, and Elizabeth and Charlotte was one of the people in line coming up to the stage to put money in one of them. So it was uh, one of those moments where we were kind of pushing the limits of certain things, giving voice to our audience to tell us, you know, what do you like, what did you didn't like, what could we do better, what do you don't ever want to see again and why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And from those talkbacks, we started going more in the direction of uh, writing content that was more topical, like we were addressing issues of rape and violence against women from a perspective of a lesbian perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, we did some skits, well, that's where Super Dyke, our mm -hmm. Super Dyke with Clausetta Lane, <laughs> Macho <laughs> White, <laughs> Fairy Wholesome, Oh, okay. uh, uh, Clint Kent. Clint Kent. Clint Kent, right. Can you tell me the years where Red Dyke was performing? 74 to 78. Our okay. last show was. And I think what happened to me is that I've missed. Uh, 76, I left, right? I left, went to LA. So for those last two years, I wasn't even here. And we so some of the stuff you're saying, I remember, and some is like, whoa, what? You know. Well, fortunately, we have tape, which is another wonderful story. We did a show, and I think it was 77, at uh, Metropolitan Community Church, and Lily Tomlin was in, we, nobody knew, we kind of had an idea that she was family, because she's always writing with Jane Wagner, mm -hmm. but back in 1976, for good reason, Lily mm -hmm. was not out of the closet, mm -hmm. and she was doing a show at the Great Southeastern Music Hall. Right? Music Hall. Yes. And I don't know, I, I know that this is as good an example of this story. I know Amy Estelle would probably have more details. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I think, this, I, this is what I witnessed. Lily Tomlin was at the Great Southeastern Music Hall. She had either seen or met Amy in her cable uniform when she worked for the cable company, mm -hmm. where she had the helmet, Lyman. the holster. Mm -hmm. And Lily said to her, something like or wrote to her and said i really like this get up that you have i'm thinking of doing a character that's a cable person would you tell me the kind of equipment that i would need well of course you know amy <laughs> she said let me come to you after the show and we can talk about it well amy not only came to her after the show brought, her the brought <laughs> us with her jean and me and amy and somebody else she brought her equipment with her. We got backstage with Lily Tomlin, and Amy said, look it, I had a spare. Instead of me just telling you all the equipment you're gonna need, I'm just gonna give this to you. Yeah. And of course, Lily, we were in the audience of Lily Tomlin, she said, oh no, no, I have to pay you for this. And Amy said, no, 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 you can't. I don't <laughs> wanna take money. And Lily said, no, I want you to, I really wanna give you some money for this. So. To which Jean, who's the ultimate schmoozer and outreach, <laughs> said, well, I tell you what, Red Dyke Theater is doing a show in the next couple of weeks. We would love for you to come and be a guest. And she looked at her calendar. She couldn't come, but she said, I tell you what. And she got out her checkbook, and she gave us a check for $500 to wow. film the performance, oh, wow. which is... I was, but is that the one which is kind of like, it's an old one, we showed at the reunion, yes. but it's off yeah. and on? Kind Those of? were excerpts from oh, okay. that. We have a bigger one that's on first one half inch reel, uh, which I don't, you know, actually I'm thinking if they have preservation people here, 
that half inch reel that Lily Tomlin actually paid for mm -hmm. could be transferred onto, well, actually we did, we transferred it years ago onto what was then a pneumatic tape, which was a three quarter inch, which nobody has players for anymore, which we then reduced down when I worked at CNN, I took the pneumatic tape, reduced it down to a VHS, which I then eventually digitized and then took excerpts from for our reunion. But we have the full two wow. and a half hour MCC performance oh. that Lily Tomlin paid but for. But I want to see that. Oh, well, <laughs> hey, well, we've got it. A lot of people want it. And there, uh, it's such a valuable history to know that Lily Tomlin paid for that for us and that that was just a wonderful experience yes, to yes. watch Jean and Amy negotiate wow. this experience. So those years that you were not there, we got a little more sophisticated in our performances. We had um, some formality to the Red Dyke Theater structure, like everybody wanted to be in Red Dyke Theater and we would have a you know, new members every year or every six months, and we started people off as stage manager just to see if we could get along. Again, in the spirit of lesbian feminism, we were very, uh, we were a collective. We operated, there were no stars. Of course, some people had some favorites, and we had a following where, sure. but we had, each of us would take turns being the director, and and then the director of a show, I would characterize that role, not in the traditional sense, but somebody who was responsible for herding everybody together, mm. for making sure all the dot I's were dotted, the T's were crossed, that everybody had rehearsed properly and kind of facilitated our rehearsals. Um, so each, but each skit or each, each um, song or each piece that you did, the group itself involved in that would would do their own directing in a way? I mean, no. how would that? No, we would propose things uh, individually of what we wanted to do in the next show. And if we wanted to resuscitate certain characters like Gladys Peach and the Clits with another song, or if we wanted to, you know, everybody was always wanting to see Peach Midler and the Dykettes, so we would always make sure and work that in. If we wanted to do a new skit that someone had written, Ah, uh, this is a good example. We brought content to the group where we met as a group and brainstormed what to do. Individuals would write things and present them to the group. We'd look them over. We'd kind of evaluate from the overall balance of the show. Okay, we want to make sure everybody has equal mm -hmm. representation. Let's do this one. Um, let's fit this in here. Uh, it would depend on the theme of the overall show, which was kind of loose. I mean, we uh, and we wanted to make sure we had a good balance of comedy, some serious skits, some AV. Always wanted to have music or some sort of sound effects. When Jane did uh, Billie Jean Queen, what was our takeoff on Billie Jean King? Mm -hmm. The sound effect, Jane was on the, oh, <laughs> we had it on tape. I remember being in the background, she was pretending she was playing tennis and I'm in the background going, <laughs> into the mic. That was our high tech sound effects. That was but pretty it, good. Uh, <laughs> still got it. <laughs> um, one of the women brought a skit that they'd written, had an experience where two older lesbians had been separated and put in separate nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And it was a real, you know, it was something we were all starting to think about back then. We were very young, but it was very clear that there were some issues related to older lesbians. Who was that? around um Aaron Ern and yeah Erwin and the pe people from the from the tower they Erwin. asked us to Betty do and Erwin? yes they or asked Betty us to Erwin do and, uh, they were having mobility issues toward they were the our, our uh, matriarch uh, oldest of the lesbians at the time and they in a talk back they asked us to do something that would Good be the them. voice of yeah. older women and, you know, we were all in our 20s, and we said we could do that. And so we got together. Uh, Fanny wrote the script. I And we decided it was about two women, that lesbians who had been separated in different, their families put them in separate nursing homes. And we would go back and forth. The way we block the scene was one over here and one over there. It was very dramatic, very moving, and 
course, with our spirit of comedy, which we would put in in appropriate places. And we decided that with the balance of that show and uh, that we decided as a group that the creator would not be in the show, but would maybe direct to make sure that the intent of what they... Mm -hmm. So those were the kind of decisions we yeah. would make based, and it was all collective, and right. um, basically starting with slumber party brainstormings over a weekend, we would come <laughs> up with stuff. And then again, we were extremely precise. Very, and since a lot of our stuff was based on recorded music, we had to be rehearsed. And, yeah, sure. and, and those were the such good times when our rehearsals. It wasn't a painful experience at all. As a matter of fact, some of us thought we liked rehearsals better than, oh, now we gotta do the show. <laughs> Which, of course, <laughs> that, forget that. And you know, I would say, and I don't wanna miss anything here, but the Great Southeastern Lesbian Conference, we would perform there. Benefits for the softball team, benefits at the time. Now there was, this comes later with the AIDS crisis. There was not an AIDS crisis at this time. It was in the 70s, yeah. so we were mainly doing benefits for uh, Alpha, Tower Lounge, any type of Fourth Tuesday, any type of anybody who, it was our audiences. We could get an audience by doing a benefit, and that's what we were there for, and we um, don't want to miss any different, because I did take some notes. Creative process, Desi. Well, so I will say, in just wrapping up the Red Deck Theater thing, in 1978, we were so popular. Oh, Southeastern lesbian and gay. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. We had gotten very popular, and people in our talkback wanted us to travel and go to other areas other than, say, Atlanta. We went to the University of Georgia and performed. We went locally, maybe as far as Chattanooga. That's as far as we got. But you have to remember, and this goes back to what I mentioned about being financially independent from men, is that we had to hold down jobs and yeah. do all of this. That was our choice, and it was a good one because, you know, there's just, in these collectives that we lived in, somebody had to be bringing in some money. <laughs> and so we were faced with a decision in 1978 and again, it was a collective decision. Okay, how many of us want to quit our jobs and take this show on the road? And we had, I mean, you know, San Francisco, we had lots of places that had already asked us to perform. And we had to make the strategic decision, and I still think it's a good one, that we just couldn't support that. That we were, uh, the makeup of our group had, um, had some, scars from not mon having money. I think we didn't want to be impoverished. We didn't want to be uh, starving artists traveling. The environment was not very stable. And it was also an environment, and you probably are familiar with this, where there were more opportunities for women, particularly women who were not encumbered with husbands and children, mm -hmm to maybe go, because of the federal regulations that were coming mm -hmm. in, there were more... Non-traditional jobs. There you go. Well, Non-traditional meaning jobs that were not as a librarian, a nurse, or an administrative assistant or secretary. There were actual good paying jobs that were held by men that a certain percentage, probably the bare minimum of a percentage, were set aside, particularly corporations that had contracts, federal contracts, that had to abide that there was opportunity there, which of course I seized as you did, um, Mickey did, and we made the decision as a group to disband, uh, and it was a majority vote, and very few dissenters. I mean, a couple of people really wanted to take it on the road, but we just couldn't sustain it, and we knew it, and um, so we disbanded. And for me, um, I tried to continue on the in a performative way after I, as a solo feminist, mime and comic, <laughs> the relationships that I cultivated through Alpha, through the softball teams, through the nightclubs with Red Dyke Theater, I kind of appropriated all of my own experiences and kind of kept 
at least kept me on the stage in the same type of venues, benefits for the same. It was not a for-profit. I never really felt like that was sustainable. It was also a time where I could supplement that with being a City of Atlanta softball umpire. <laughs> with one of the women here who frequents the women's collection, Beth Shapiro, the first... Ah, she was the first. She was the one. I said, we can do this? And she said, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I signed up and... You know, I love. I also love the game of softball. And after a while, you know, we realized we can't be playing. You know, I went from player to I was assistant coach for a little while at mm-hmm. uh, Alpha Omega. Then there was the Southern Fury, right? Southern Didn't Fury. We yeah. went. I think we kind of that was in that first. was the year that I left. But I was in Southern Furies until I left that year, seventy six. Yes, yeah. and we had spinoffs. There was the Tower Hot Shots, the Meshuganas. Mm-hmm. Um, Alpha Amazons. Alpha Amazons. Oh, the Alpha Amazon. We got a little competitive there, I think. <laughs> I think we were like, hey, what happened to this non-competitive? I remember one game. Oh, that's right. We had a conference, and it was a gay, lesbian conference, and we had an exhibition, Alpha Amazons versus the Alpha Omegas. Oh. And this it's even better. gets even better. I was the umpire. <laughs> with Carol Victoria. Oh, yes, yes. And we, Carol and I were like, do we really want to do this? And I said, sure, <laughs> we're you professionals. You're going to be in trouble. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I have to really call upon all of my skills as an objective, no vested interest, <laughs> you know, that play at the plate, that close one. I was like, Carol, you take that one. No, it was, uh, that's true. <laughs> We had we had evolved again. What I love about this continuity of my own experience is I can see how adaptable and how agile we were, and how we really didn't discard any experience. We appropriated it mm-hmm. in a way, molded it, morphed it into something else. Um, as a solo performance artist and in a way a softball umpire I mean you can't be any I'm in the game man but I ain't playing and uh, that was actually being a softball umpire was wonderful I loved that experience I don't know if you've were you an umpire at all or was that Martha really um, again it was one of those non-traditional things I remember Mm -hmm. People were very, there was only me and Beth Shapiro, and uh, we were umpire, I mean, we would umpire men's fast pitch games. I mean, we were out there at Piedmont Park, just like the guys, and at the time, in the climate, they were not used to a woman being an umpire. And, you know, just as I did with Xerox, we had to prove ourselves that we could, in fact, do this work. And, you know, it didn't take us long to do it a whole lot better. <laughs> I mean, we were, yeah, I, I remember. As so were there, were there, I don't mean to tell a lot of stories, but was there, you remember an incident which you, you, you could say how you're calling something which you never would have questioned by a, with a man empire that you were being uh, challenged or questioned about it? Well, it's all in your presentation. And I knew that before I even set foot on the field, I had to rehearse a strike call. The actual confidence behind a call. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you go out there, you're going to go, hey, wait a minute, that's a girl doing that. I don't understand, you know, (laughs) girl. And then the very first call, you, you prove yourself by what they see. And I want them over the first game. I remember I had a strike call that was very dramatic. <laughs> it was Steve. I mean, it was your classic. I got it down. It became my trademark. And I remember the first year I umpired, I had a group of young kids that would come to my games that would stand behind that backstop just hoping I was calling the plate because we would switch back and forth. Oh, yeah, you either yeah. call the plate or you call the field. And so I think there was a show womanship behind it that was my entry in. And 
mm-hmm. you, you cannot disguise incompetence. So there was a skill there of competence. And my years as a tomboy really paid off because one of the, th- and my years in baseball and softball, because the key thing you have to do is keep your eye on the ball mm-hmm. for your own safety and you have to be approaching the what you see without judgment. You cannot have a vested interest and believe me that is a challenge because mm-hmm. some of those um, teams were very competitive and particularly when we got into the men's fast pitch, they did not were not at all happy until I proved myself, mm-hmm. which I, like I said, I went in with a reputation that I think I established early on and I knew from a performing standpoint that it had to be very obvious that I knew what I was doing, I was good at this, and you know, you make a f- couple of close calls at first play, uh, first base, or the, the stress calls, which could turn a game from winners to losers, you are making sure that the people in the audience and the team see that you are in the proper position to see the call that you are there in a fearless way as that 175 pound person is sliding into the plate with a catcher throwing off their mask you need to stay right in there and keep your eye on the ball and see what happens and immediately know you can't hesitate you can't you yeah, know i think yeah, when you got to be got that be sure and and if, even if so what so once in a while, if you did you get so good that even if it was a close call and you weren't sure, you were still sounded very authoritative. Oh yeah, you had to be, and you know you got to take keep in mind that fifty percent of the people there are gonna. <laughs> so you know, and the other fifty are gonna go. Oh man, missing a good game, on her. you know. But it was again like Xerox, like anything I did that was in a non-traditional way. I learned early on and I'm I, this was the climate and I think there was even a button that said women have to be twice as good as men right to be considered half as good mm-hmm. fortunately this is not difficult well it was <laughs> difficult at first but it, when you persevere and you realize that this is the uh, this is the this is what I've agreed to do and you know, being Italian, coming from Buffalo, and that environment, I knew that okay, I, this is my opportunity. So I'm gonna not only accept this challenge, but I'm gonna blow them away. And I think it's a good. Yeah. Uh, I would say that is my mo, and I like it. And I like that I have those types of successes that did not come without. Challenges, rehearsals, preparation. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is not something that you go in rolling the dice. You don't step out on the field as an umpire. Like, and when, when we went up to Chicago for the Gay Olympics, which was, I was invited, the city of Atlanta, uh, 1983, I won the best umpire for the city of Atlanta. Um, ah, they were all right, excited yes. because in three years, from being a newbie to this pageant that they have every year which I didn't even know about that and it was all voted on by a legacy right. male umpires they you said had, no she's the best one over everybody because you knew what you were doing yeah and I was invited to umpire at the gay olympics which were in Chicago I think that was maybe 82 I don't remember that's wild yeah. that's great. oh that was boy I was that was great that was like the and we had some teams from Atlanta that went well, the other women umpires there would seem like they would be. In Chicago. They were from yeah, all Chicago, over the country. Yeah. So I was there now with my umpire peeps <laughs> that were all lesbians. And all right. we were, and the way they did the Gay Olympics, then we didn't have any men umpires. Ah. They had just women that had come from, uh, it was great. Right. I, yeah, I, yeah. I, a wonderful experience. Wonderful. <laughs> so appropriating mm-hmm. my own experience. Do you have to go to the bathroom? No. I think I do. But I'm going to wait because I want to finish this thought. Okay. Um, so appropriating my own experiences to keep me in a game, to keep me on the stage, probably after I realized the solo performance thing really, 
although it was wonderful, I loved it. I mean, I got to mingle with the uh, uh, as a mime, which I really got into as a with Red Dyke Theater. I decided to research the history of mime, which, of course, you know, come, stems from our people, our Italians. And I uh, really wanted to get into studying performance mime, which I did. I hooked up with a lot of the mimes in Atlanta. We did a couple of Atlanta mime festivals, which mm. I was very successful in, got to be with mime peeps, and kind of merged that with solo performance that was based on comedic monologues, which I was one of, if I wasn't in whiteface, I was a talking mime, which got me a chance to do <laughs> uh, solo drama, solo performance. Um, is that, is, can you say more how that might have led or connected with the same, working with that more traditional theater. Yes. Thing. As a matter of fact, I'm glad you brought that up because as I moved from Red Dyke Theater, which was fringe, off, 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 Broadway type of uh, theater, guerrilla theater, to more happenings, guerrilla theater, the moving into solo performance, I was able to establish myself in still kind of fringe. My main venues were the nightclubs, the gay bars, the women's bars, uh, MCC, Fourth Tuesday, and working in tandem like one year, a uh, Robin Tyler found out about me and she sent me an e uh, a, was a phone call. I pick up the phone and I hear this Robin Tyler going, okay, so what the hell is a lesbian mime and a comic? <laughs> and I said, well, uh, why don't you come to Atlanta and I'll tell you. And she was just happened to be visiting. So we <laughs> planned in a couple of months to do a show together at Illusions, which was really uh, my first move into some sort of a legitimate type. Because Robin came already with a, with a history. She was already a celebrity. We had a great time. I also did a show with Kate Clinton mm -hmm. at the Existentials Church. Oh. Again, I was starting as a solo performer to meet up with other like women that were doing stuff, which made me, A, realize I'm not going to be able to sustain this. Plus, I wasn't sure if I liked the idea of the way they all had to move around all the time. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. Can, you've got, and I'm a nester. I mean, 40 years, same place, same yeah. house. And you already I, had your relationship. And yeah, everything. I just, I, and you know, you just can't come up with new material all the time to be able to uh, satisfy a place. current. Yeah. So I, again, I appropriated that experience for me to say, you know, I think I need to focus now on gainful employment and see if I can keep this performance and umpiring, which in many ways was performance, right, athletic right. performance, in my life. And that's when I got hired at CNN, which for eight, the next 18 years gave me a chance to really indulge in nonprofit without having to rely on it for my own income. And that's where SANE came along, mm -hmm. the Southeastern Arts, Media, and Education Project. And I will say, Rebecca Ranson, who was the founder of Sane, changed my life. All right. This was a foray into exactly what I wanted to do. The AIDS crisis had already happened around 1982 and 83, and I do have something about Sane. I want to make sure I say it right. Uh, Sane was a multidisciplinary Atlanta-based gay and lesbian nonprofit. And uh, Rebecca, who founded it, had a vision, which I embraced, which was to use art and music and literature and drama to give voice to LGBT issues, particularly the AIDS crisis, which was the impetus for her to start this. I mean, yeah. Rebecca is the consummate social activist. I adored, she, I just fell in love with her immediately when we met, we clicked right away. She was someone who legitimized a lot of the peripheral theater, guerrilla theater, uh, drag performance and brought it into a more 
focused, purposeful project in her fund. She was an excellent fundraiser, schmoozer, was able to sustain. She was a great nonprofit person. Mm -hmm. And her years of burnout will prove it. She's got, I mean, she had to go through phases of the nonprofit burnout. But when I worked with Rebecca, uh, and I came in after uh, Sane had started. So when, when, when was that? Um, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> uh, the organization uh, during its first 10 years, 1985 to 1995, was during that time period where it was the most active. So I would, I think it probably started in 83 and 84, but the actual performances were documented starting in 84 with Warren, which was the very first AIDS play, and it's known nationally for that. Um, incidentally, uh, Rebecca, uh, now that I work in Emory, um, and Emory as Georgia State, but Emory's Marble, which is the manuscript archives and rare book library, which is their special collections, over the last two years has been building an LGBT collection right. and so when I found out about this I kind of hooked up with the curator and I said look at you know I've got some stuff through Rebecca Ranson and Sane and uh, Alpha and Red Dyke Theater and he was like bring it on so in the last two years last year we secured Rebecca's entire archive her oh. special collection along with her same collection her from her work with Sane and all the other participants of Sane that I knew of was able to contact and get them to donate their mm -hmm. holdings so there's a huge everything now is in under the protective custody of Emory University's Marvel collection and actually they're gonna I'm gonna do something with them next month on Red Deck Theater mm -hmm. they have stuff from Alpha already at Marvel. They have Sherlene's work, some of Sherlene's Holmes's work. Okay. It's a huge collection, and, and I think this is a good year coming up for them to even build it further because they're renovating the place, so their, their uh, desk work is minimized, and they're able to build these collections. This year is going to be a very productive intake year. So same on um, 10 years. During that time, we produced 70 plays, original film and video. Rebecca was really into AV filming. We had a lot of people that were multimedia people involved with same because we wanted to, the technology was there. We were able to affordably record things. We had radio shows. We had work with WRFG. Rebecca had a lot of connections with Seven Stages, Horizon Theater. So again, legitimizing um, and giving voice to some of our concerns in a non-fringe way is where yeah. Rebecca was brilliant. Um, I think on my resume that I gave you, and this, I'll refer to this because there was, uh, like I said, changed my life. With Rebecca, I was able to, oh, here it is, the avocational experience, okay. Um, I worked with Rebecca as an actor, as a stage manager, and as an acting coach. And I would say in the time that I was with her, and, and really after, in the late 80s and early 90s, Rebecca, after she came out as a lesbian herself, she was starting to balance out some of the same projects, which were primarily geared towards gay men and addressing the AIDS mm -hmm. crisis. Um, through theater or performance, she was starting to write plays about lesbians and incorporating more of the lesbian feminist community. And, you know, then again, right up my alley. So I volunteered. As, I'll do anything. I'll be your assistant director. I'll be your, I'll be an actor. I'll, I'm good at stage managing, um, which, of course, is a, something that I went into when I was at CNN. I decided, you know, I'll finally get my undergraduate degree. I mean, Georgia State is three quarters of a mile from <laughs> CNN. Right, right. Maybe now that I'm almost 40, let's start getting some education. So I decided after many minors to major in theater and communication studies. 
And I was able to sustain that really the whole time I was at CNN to get a bachelor's, a master's, and what I call an ABCD PhD, which is all but comps and dissertation. <laughs> in communication studies, theater, and performance studies. So again, appropriating my own experience mm -hmm. to bring to SANE in these capacities that were legitimate theater. Now I'm in a venue with Rebecca who is kind of bridging that gap. And um, I learned the praxis with Rebecca and my theory of theater in my academic life. It was just uh, such a exciting time for me yeah. to work with her yeah. and to w watch her I have to take a pause here. Well, I tell you what, I think I, I can. Know how to do it. I, I do just it. have. I tell you what, I'm just going to wrap this up, and then yes. I'll go to the rest of it, and then we can talk more questions. Okay. But I do have a point. One of the things that Rebecca did, in, we did in 1990. It was one of our her pieces called "As I See Myself Changing," mm -hmm. and it was her way. She wanted to incorporate uh, art, literature, and dramatic performance. It was a Tula's art gallery. Wow. And we put together an eclectic show, only women, and the criteria is you had to be over 35. Mm -hmm. And we did our own pieces, whether it be music, art, poster art, okay. or wow. dramatic performance. And at that time, I was, I think it really hit me, and this was way back in 1990, that I was, in fact, becoming an older woman. <laughs> <laughs> I just like, oh my God, you know, I, I woke up one day and looked at my watch and what I saw coming out of my sleeve was my mother's hand. And that was the visceral experience of, I'm becoming an old woman. And I will say in advance of this interview, I've kind of had that experience again because I think now as at 60 years old, I have officially become an older woman. But I gotta tell 60 you. 60 is usually the official. The official. Elderhood, seniorhood, the 30th, cronhood. The 30th anniversary of my 30th birthday is now here. And I will say, <laughs> I will say that unlike when I saw myself changing back with Rebecca, which was the first time it occurred to me that I was getting older or was becoming an older woman, this time, when I turned 60, I, I, real, I honestly was not afraid. And I'm not afraid of these changes, these transformations that I see I'm undergoing, and I'll tell you why. The reason I am not afraid is because I have these decades of my own personal experience now to use as my backup, my buffer, my references, my work cited, for example. When I was, I can look back to a time in my 20s, during the 70s, young buck. And back then, <laughs> my life goals were to experience as much as possible in as many ways as possible and to do it all with steady romance and some sleep. <laughs> when I turned 30, my life goals were to get a job, keep a job. Get a house, keep a house. Get a girlfriend, keep a girlfriend. <laughs> Retain my shape. On the day that I turned 40, my life goals were to finally graduate from college and to avoid having to undergo a hysterectomy. Mm. Okay. When I turned 50, my life goals were to fill gaps and successfully recover from a hysterectomy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now that I'm 60, my life goals are to keep my balance. <laughs> help. Do you more. mean that in many ways? Yes, okay. many ways. <laughs> help more than hurt. Continue breathing. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. So I think I, and I, I'll just kind of end it there.